Hey, this is Pastor Aaron Pino. I'm the lead pastor of Overflow Church, and I just want to say thank you for listening to our podcast. It's my prayer that this message encourages you, builds your faith, and helps develop you in the spiritual maturity. Enjoy the message. Awesome. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And... uh, As you're turning there, I want to encourage everybody in the room that you are born on purpose and for a purpose, that you are not an accident. Uh, No matter what people have said, no matter what people have told you, no matter even maybe a parent or a loved one, a grandparent, maybe have spoken over your life, I declare this to you prophetically. I break that spirit of the curse that's been assigned to your life, and I, and I declare over you that you have value and that you have worth. Amen? <clears throat> now, I know not everyone shouted amen on that because maybe you don't believe that, but that's all right. I believe it for you. Okay? Have you found Revelation chapter 5 verse uh, 9 yet? Go ahead and stand with me quickly for the reading of God's Word, and then I'll have you sit down, and you'll be seated for another three and a half to five hours, and you'll have a good time. I hope you brought your stadium cushion for your, for your cushion. There you go. <laughs> Revelation chapter 5, starting at verse 9, it says this, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Let me just take a two-second praise break. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Let's continue. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us, watch this now, kings and priests to our God. And we, someone say we, We. put your hand on your chest and say me, Me. and we shall reign on the earth. Let me pray over the word of God this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the, the fierceness of your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is strong. We thank you, Lord, that your word accomplishes everything that has been sent out to accomplish. Because you watch over your word to perform it. And so, Father, this morning I ask you that you would perform your word in our lives today. Lord, I thank you for a rearranging, a realignment. Lord, uh, a revelation that would be dropped in our spirits today that would leave us forever changed. Lord, we declare in this room right now that we do not want to leave the same way that we walked in here today. And so, Father, we thank you for the transformation that comes as a byproduct of heeding your word. Your word says in Psalm 19, let me just pray this out. It says, how can a man keep his way pure by taking heed to the word of God? I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so, Father, today, let this word run deep and swiftly in our lives in Jesus' mighty name. Someone shout amen as you have a seat. Hallelujah. I feel the anointing of God in the room today. Gloria dos, yeah. See what I did there? You don't know if you don't speak Spanish, so. We are in a series entitled Kings and Priests. And friend, over the last several weeks, I've been encouraging you and teaching you and investing into you this word about the fact That you have been brought into this kingdom, not as a dud, but as a stud. Hallelujah. Just came up with that right now. Hallelujah. I know y'all been praying for me. I've been praying for you. I can feel the prayers of the saints right now. But you have been brought into this kingdom 
Not because of anything else except for the fact that God has looked at you and has declared you worthy of his sacrifice. And because you have been called worthy of the sacrifice, he has put a robe on your back. He has put a ring on your finger and sandals on your feet. And he has established you in this kingdom, not as a subject, but as a son. I shared with you the first week that that we started talking about this. The reason why in scripture you never hear about you being born into the kingdom and be called a daughter is not because God is a sexist person. But the reason why once you get born into the kingdom, even if you're male or female, you are called now a son because sons are males who can release seed. And in the kingdom, you are a son because you have something on the inside of you that needs to be released into the world around you. That way, what comes from you can germinate in your sphere of influence and it begins to not look like you, but it begins to look like the kingdom that you have been brought into. Buckle up now. I'll tell you what now. I, feel the, I told you I felt the anointing, so don't play with me. Y'all thinking, man, Pastor Aaron's starting off strong today. Yes, I am, because we got some ground to cover today. Hallelujah. And so listen, if you have been born into this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, number one, the blood is the only way in. Your good works don't let you in. Your offerings don't let you in. Your piety does not let you in. Hello? Hello? The only thing that allows you to cross over the threshold to be from the kingdom of darkness translated into the kingdom of life is one and one thing only. And it is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission or sending away of sins. So it's only through the blood. That's why it says right here in Revelation chapter 5, you have redeemed us to God by your blood. I know a lot of people don't like the the message of the blood. It's kind of nasty. I don't like it. I don't understand that. No, you need to get this deep down in your spirit. If you are a child of God, you need to be thankful for the blood. They used to sing a song back whenever I was a kid. I'm not going to sing it to you now. But they said the blood will never lose its power. It reaches to the lowest valley and it reaches to the highest mountain. And I'm so grateful that even whenever I was in that valley low, that the blood still reached down deep into that valley and it brought me out. The blood did something for me that I could not do for myself. The blood has saved me. The blood has redeemed me. The blood has washed me. The blood has purified me. I am thankful for the blood. And because of that blood, I am now called a son of God. Is there anybody in the room this morning that is thankful for the blood? Come on, lift up a shout if you're thankful for the blood of Jesus. It did something for you that you could not do for yourself. Give him praise for the blood. I ain't even trying to preach. I'm trying to teach this morning, y'all. So we are now kings and priests through the blood of Jesus. We are now royalty. Can you feel that? You might say, I don't feel nothing. What are you feeling, Pastor Aaron? I feel the tide shifting. What are you feeling, Pastor Aaron? I feel something turning over in the spirit. I feel people coming alive to their identity in the room. I feel people who've been floundering in their faith for years beginning to become alive because of the identity that is brought into your life through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are royalty. And my friend, you need to understand something. It's one thing to say we are. It's something completely different to act like we are. Our behavior or function is a result, watch this now, of the culture in which we live. Look around you. The culture of this world naturally is crazy. Well, I don't know if it's that crazy. No, listen, it's crazy, y'all. Cray. 
The other day, I was, I was sitting there with my, my daughter, Bella. We were watching something. I, I forget what we were watching. And all of a sudden, she goes, Dad, that's cray. I said, woman of God, what'd you just say? She goes, Dad, that's cray. I said, that's right, it is cray. Go ahead, baby, go ahead. But listen, the culture around us is crazy. And honestly, the reason why the culture around us is crazy is because it's a fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus said that in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. And that they will become lovers of themselves and haters of God. So what we're seeing around us in culture and society is a manifestation of a prophetic word that was declared by Jesus thousands of years ago. And so you know what? I don't get upset about the world acting like the world because the world's supposed to act like the world because they don't know. What I get upset about is the fact That there are believers in the earth that are satisfied with the culture of the earth not looking like the culture of the kingdom. You understand that our culture, the culture of the kingdom of heaven, is not the culture of this world. Friend, I want to encourage you with this. The culture of the kingdom of heaven is actually a far superior culture. Well, I don't know if we're better than anybody else. I don't know. No, listen, we better than other people. Because right now, people are dead in their sins and they don't know it. Here's the fallacy that happens that you have it so good and you forget about the people who have it so bad that you want to hoard what you got all to yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's all right. The tide's turning. It's all right. The tide is turning. Let me speak to you prophetically. God is raising up a people that say, you know what? I know that I got peace. I know that I got joy. I know that I got strength. I'm not saying that I don't have any troubles, but what I am saying is I got faith in God. And because I have faith in God, everything's going to be all right. I love it. The other day I was in the car with Ashley. And uh, we're, we're driving somewhere, and we're just talking about how good God has been to us, how we have peace now, how we have strength now. And I just looked at her, I said, man, I, I don't know how people make it without Jesus. And I said, I try to make it without Jesus. And she said something that's so profound. I looked at her, I said, you must be a scholar. You want to know what she said? She said, that's right. We have something that the world needs. They don't need an ice cream bar to come into the kingdom. I said, go ahead, scholar Ashley Pino, woman of God. But it's so true. We try to win the world with these idiotic things when the reality is, is we have what the world needs. The world doesn't need an ice cream social or a taco bar. What the world needs is to know, how do I have hope for today? How do I have peace today in the middle of my storm? How can I have strength whenever everything else has let me down? And my friend, I want to encourage you today that you have and I have what the world is looking for. And what it is, it is the kingdom of heaven. It's the sacrifice and the story of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But I've met too many believers who are satisfied with the culture of the world, not looking like the culture of the kingdom. You must understand that you and I have an obligation, have a duty, have a mission for this world to look like that world. To have the earth look like heaven. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6 that when we pray, that we should pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on Mars. I'm just making sure you're awake this morning. That's all I'm checking. I know some people like to drift off in the Holy Ghost. You can sloke on your own time. 
Sloking is sleeping and soaking in the presence at the same time. I'm a professional at both. But Jesus did not say, your kingdom come, your will be done on Mars or Jupiter, on the moon as it is in heaven. No, no, no. He said, pray that your kingdom come on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Can I just kind of give you a little different way of saying it? Your kingdom come, your will be done in Las Vegas as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done at my job as it is in heaven. In my family as it is in heaven. In my business as it is in heaven. Around my kitchen table as it is in heaven. Raising my kids as it is in heaven. Interacting with my loved ones as it is in heaven. Hello? The earth is supposed to look like heaven. So why doesn't the earth look like heaven? If it's supposed to and it doesn't, that lets me know that something hasn't come into alignment yet. Would you agree to that? I believe... The reason why earth does not look like heaven because the kings and the priests of the kingdom you and me we're not ruling. Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 says this you have made them a, a kings and priests unto our God and they shall reign on the earth. Now, I know many people talk about that's the millennial reign. Whenever Jesus Christ comes back, we're going to rule and reign. Yeah, we are going to rule and reign there. But I believe that God has given us a mandate to make earth look like heaven now. To make Las Vegas look like heaven now. And the reason why it doesn't is because many believers, even some in this room, you are not acting like a king and a priest. And don't, don't worry about that. I'm not trying to intentionally hurt your feelings. I say that to bring awareness to the fact that there needs to be teaching on what it is that you have been called into. You need to be taught what your function and your purpose in the earth should be. Because I can tell you all day long, you're a king, you're a priest. Oh, hallelujah, thank you, thank you. Hey, you're a king and a priest. Thank you. You can dance with the best from around here in the altar. But until you know what that really means, you're never going to operate in, your, in the fullness of your identity. You see, whenever my children were born, and they were born pino, they had some of my traits. Would you agree to that? You know, they have... My nose, my eyes, they have all my hair. <laughs> Someone said this morning, they said, man, Max's hair always looks so good. He must get his hair from you. I say, that's where it went. I had no idea where it went. They even have my DNA. If you were to take a forensic file of my blood and take a sample of their blood and a sample of my blood, they would be able to trace us back down to our ancestors because even though they're born with Pino as my name, they still have traits that are about me. Would you agree to that? But here's the thing. They might have some of my traits and even have my DNA, but the, u- but the uniqueness of who they are in our family, the culture of our family, watch this now, needs to be taught and caught. The reason why they need to understand the culture, they need to catch it and they need to learn it, is because they need to understand the standard of our home, the standard of our lives. So just as a child is is born into a family, you have been born into a kingdom and you have traits of that kingdom. Traits of that kingdom are freedom, forgiveness, peace, joy. 
And even though you might not realize it, remember I said DNA, you can't really see someone's DNA unless you put it under a microscope. The DNA of the kingdom is this, you have a new identity. And so just because you have been brought into the kingdom and you have the traits, you still need to learn the culture of the kingdom because the culture of the kingdom is the standard of the kingdom. Y'all track with me so far? I know I'm teaching right now, but I need you to put you on your thinking cap because we, we're going some places right here in the next 20 minutes, more like 30, okay? But anyway, <clears throat> when we are born again, we all have traits of the kingdom. Now we must learn the standard of the kingdom, which is the culture of the kingdom. And I believe that one of the key cultures of this kingdom is the culture of honor. Honor. Now, I've met too many people in my life. I met too many people in this city. I met too many people in this church who do not understand what the culture of honor really is. Now, I'm not coming at you harshly because I'm trying to spank you. I am telling you this because I believe that God is inviting us as a whole into a higher standard. I told someone this a couple weeks ago. We had an event, and it went off really well, and we had some things going on and that kind of thing, and and we had a debriefing meeting afterwards. And we had some things in the background. I'm not trying to uncover the the blankets on anybody, okay? I'm not saying names. I'm not doing other ones. Oh, come on. Some of y'all just leaned up in your chair a little bit closer. It's like, what's going on, Pastor? I want the nitty-gritties. You can have these nitty-gritties, Okay. We had this thing, and, and there were some things that were crazy in the background. We had a debriefing meeting, and I said, guys, this is one of the best things that could have happened to us. And they said, what? what are you talking about? I said, because this has exposed something to me, that we are really good at honoring God in our house, but we need to learn how to honor people. In this house, we honor God. Let me tell you, in this house, we honor people. And I'll tell you why. Honor means to pay or return worth to something. Honor in the kingdom is dealing with God and with people, not from our earthly perspectives, but with heaven's perspective. And the thing that you need to understand about this, whenever we approach God... In honoring him, it simply means to honor God, we assign him worth by giving him our very best. Our very best time, our very, our very best offering, our very best worship, our very best thoughts, our very best words. Why? Because he is worthy of our very best. He gave his very best for us, therefore we need to give our very best for him. So we honor God in this house. We show up on time for worship. We serve in the different departments in this church. We give of our tithes and of our offerings. We lift our hands during during the worship service. We lift our voices even whenever Pastor Aaron is singing some crazy spontaneous song of the Lord and there's no words on the screen. I'm going to sing it anyway, with, with, without you, okay, with or without you. But listen, we honor God in this house, and we give him our very best because God is worthy of it. He's worthy of our best. So that's how we honor God. We honor people or assign them worth by interacting with them, not out of our perception of them, but out of heaven's perspective of them. And heaven says that people are valuable. You don't got to say amen on that. That's all right. I'm amening on the inside of me. I hear roars of crowds shouting me amen right now in heaven. Heaven says that people are valuable. Heaven says that people are worthy. Heaven says that people deserve love. Heaven says that people are deserving of respect and honor. 
My friend, you need to understand something. If heaven sees you as worthy, even when you were, you were not worthy for the world and Christ died for you, he saved you, he sacrificed himself for you. If heaven thinks that you are worthy enough to save, how much more don't you think he, he, he wants you to realize that your neighbor is worthy too? That your neighbor is honorable too? That the people that God has put in your sphere of influence, they are worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus. So you know what? You know how I interact with people? I interact with people knowing that the gift of God is on the inside of them. Well, what if they're not saved, Pastor Aaron? Do I still need to honor them too? Yes. Because even though they don't know, God has deemed them as worthy. Worthy of what? Worthy of the sacrifice of his son. So we honor up and we honor all around. We honor up to the Lord and we honor all around. We honor those who are in the trenches with us at work. We honor those who are sitting next to us in church. We honor those who may, I know you might not like this, but we even honor those who work for us. We honor those who are Beneath us on a hierarchical level in our place of employment. Why? Because we are people of honor. Well, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're really deserving or worth. Look, just because they, I, I didn't say they have to receive the honor. You just got to give the honor. Psh. Well, I'm only going to honor people who honor me. You know what? That is so immature and that is so elementary. I think I will say it again. That is so immature. And that is so elementary. We honor everybody. Why? Because God honors everybody. We are kings and priests. And we live in, the, in a culture of honor. And let me just establish a standard here from this stage. As the senior leader of this church. The, the apostle of this house. In this house. We will be. People of honor, period. We'll be people of honor in this room. We'll be people of honor in that lobby. We'll be people of honor in the parking lot. But some of y'all saying, I don't know if I can honor people once I get past the parking lot because they drive crazy. No, listen, you're still going to honor them. You just put that thing down right there, okay, and then you just don't. But listen, in this house, we honor people. Because people are worthy of honor. So the question becomes, how do we become people of honor? Because Pastor Aaron, you're telling us, okay, we're people of honor, that's great, uh, awesome. Yeah, I want to be a person of honor. How do I do that? I'm glad you asked. And maybe you said, I didn't ask that. No, you did. I, I could read your mind, okay? I could read right deep down into your heart, to your cerebral cortex. Yes. Mandula oblongata. Yeah, I don't know if you know this or not, but I know big words. I don't know what the words mean half the time, but I know them. So how do we become people of honor? And what is the result of being honorable? I'm going to share with you very briefly three passages of scripture of dishonor. And the results of people's dishonor. And I think we're mature enough in this room to learn by their mistakes. Hallelujah, Pastor Aaron. I don't know about you, but I like to learn from other people. That way I don't have to learn by myself. Because, my friend, you didn't understand. Dummy tax is expensive. You get that one on the way home, okay? You'll, You'll get that one on the way home. Pastor Aaron, what's dummy tax? Dummy tax is not learning from those who've done what you've tried to do before. And you want to go around and do it yourself, knucklehead. Dummy tax is expensive. So we're going to look through three stories. I don't think we have time to read every scripture verse on here. I encourage you to go back in your devotional time this weekend to read it. But these three stories are stories where people dishonored and the results that came into their life. The first one (coughs) is found in Numbers chapter 12. I don't have time to read it. But whenever you go home today or this week or whatever, 
take a little note right now, Numbers chapter 12. When you write down Numbers chapter 12, you're going to open up to your Bible, and then you're going to get the podcast of Overflow Church with Pastor Aaron Pino and re-listen to the message after you read the scripture. Glory. I say glory. glory. I want you to read through this story, but in Numbers chapter 12, there's some siblings, three siblings that have come into a little bit of a disagreement. The youngest of the siblings' name is Moses. The older brother, his name is Aaron, and the middle sister, her name is Miriam. And Aaron and Miriam get upset at Moses because Moses' wife has died, and Moses then remarries an Ethiopian woman. And after he marries this Ethiopian woman... His brother Aaron and his sister Miriam start to murmur and complain at the fact that Moses married a black woman. Pastor Aaron, you really going there? I'm really going there this morning, y'all. So they started murmuring and complaining about Moses because they thought Moses had lost his mind and he did not know what he was doing you got to read this story, Numbers chapter 12. And so the Bible tells us that whenever they were murmuring and complaining, that their complaints and murmuring actually went up before the Lord. And that the Lord heard their complaints and murmuring against Moses. And so God spoke to Aaron, Miriam, and Moses and said, Hey, I want you to go to the door of the tent of meeting. I'm going to meet you there. Now, if you understand the context of this, it's a little, uh, 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 how do I say this, nerve-wracking. Because if you know anything about God in that scenario, God actually lived in the Holy of Holies, which was three rooms in from the tent of meeting. So God basically said, I'm about to get up out of here, go down to where you are at. Y'all can't come in here except for Moses. I'm going to come and talk to you all. And so God went out of the Holy of Holies and he went to the tent of meeting and he speaks to Ariam. Uh, Arian, you like that? (laughs) Big words, you know, I told you. He speaks to Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. And he says, Aaron and Miriam, I have heard your complaining against my servant Moses. And he said, prophets, I speak to them in visions and dreams. But with Moses, I actually speak to him as a man speaks to his friend face to face. And you have dishonored my servant. And you know what's amazing about that? God just goes down there, gives a little spanking, and then it says that he just took off. And it says as soon as the Lord departed them, that Miriam became leprous with leprosy. You know, I, I, I read that story and I thought to myself, uh-huh, Mary want, didn't like black so much that God made her so white that she had to be put outside the city. Come on now. You need to understand the consequences of dishonor. And so it says that once God departed, that Miriam became a leper. If you read the context of the story, I kind of laugh too because it says that Aaron looked at her and said, oh, Lord. It's like he didn't know that she had turned, and he looked over at her and said, oh, my gosh. And, and Aaron began to cry out, and he said, Moses, please do something. Don't let her be diseased like a dead man. Because if you know anything about leprosy, it caused you to be withheld from the community of your faith. So Aaron said, Moses, do something. So Moses cried out to God on behalf of Miriam. And God spoke to Moses. Why? Because God spoke to Moses like he spoke to a friend. They try to dishonor the man of God. And God said, even if her father spit in her face, she needs to be put outside the camp for at least seven days. And so it says the pillar of cloud left the camp and Miriam had to be put outside the camp. So I begin to read this story and pray on this story. And the results of Miriam's dishonor 
Number one is a going away from the manifest presence of God. It's the first result of her dishonor. The second result for her dishonor, she became a leper, leprosy. That might not need anything to you, but you need to understand the, the, the type of leprosy that turns your hand, that turns your skin white, it's a result of your blood being bad, and it doesn't manifest, if you, if you know the, the scientific and the medical things that happen, what happens is first, before your skin even turns white, your body becomes numb. So Miriam's dishonored not only allowed the presence of the Lord to be withdrawn from them, but it caused a numbness in Miriam's life. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I don't know about you, but I need, I, I'm so grateful that I serve a God that I can feel. I don't just serve him because I want a goosebump, but I'm so glad that he is so real to me that I can sense him whenever he's near and, but what we read in this story is Miriam's dishonor caused her to become numb in her body. And my friend, I'm telling you right now, this is the result of her dishonor. The, the third thing that happened is this. She had to be put outside the camp. It means that she missed out on what she so desperately needed. I don't have time to teach on you about Jewish community. And, who, and, and the power of being in, in community. But you need to understand this. Miriam needed her community, but because she dishonored, she had to be put outside the camp. And lastly, because of her dishonor, it says that the cloud of God departed. And you might not understand that, but let me break it down for you. The children of Israel, they encamped around the manifest presence of God. They set up a tabernacle wherever the pillar of cloud came or wherever the pillar of fire came. The Bible tells us that whenever the fire stopped, they would stop. Whenever the fire left, they would leave. Whenever the pillar of cloud would come, they would stop. Whenever the pillar of cloud would leave, they would follow the cloud and they would follow the fire. You ready for this? Miriam's dishonor caused the entire camp to have to wait for seven days. Whenever God moved, they could not move. Help me, Holy Ghost. Miriam's dishonor slowed down the vision of an entire nation. So friends, what is the result of your dishonor or honor? The result of this is an effect on our community. It's an effect on our city. It's an effect on your family. It's an effect on you it's an effect on this church. Whenever you are not a person of honor, the thing that is affected most might not be you to the full extent, but it's the community of people that God has surrounded you with. So the question is, how do we become people of honor? I'm glad you asked that for a second time. Hallelujah. The way you become people of honor. You ready? Remember I told leprosy was a result from bad blood. That bad blood was thrown throughout your entire body, through your heart. The way you become a person of honor is this. You determine in your heart that you're going to be a person of honor. You determine in your heart that I am going to be a person of honor. Come on, I want you to put your hand on your heart right now. And just say, I am a person of honor. Say it one more time. I am a person of honor. Hallelujah. Someone shout amen. amen. My God, I need to hurry up. My, all right, here we go. The second story is found in Genesis chapter 9. You don't have to turn there, but this is basically Noah has escaped the flood. He and his family have escaped the flood because they built an ark God, he heard the voice of the Lord. He built an ark. The, the waters came. Uh, the, the fountains of the deep were opened up. There was lots of water there. 40 days, 40 nights, it rained. And they were, they were on the ark for a long time. And so the water subsided. Noah and his family come out of the ark. 
And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 9 that Noah built an ark. I mean, Noah, built, Noah planted a vineyard. He made wine and got drunk. And I read this and I said, yeah, I probably would have too, you know. <laughs> I'm not a drinker by any means, you know what I mean? But my God, being, being up in the ark for that long? <laughs> and you would have too, so don't even look at me like that, okay? <clears throat> and the Bible says that Noah got drunk and went into his tent and fell asleep. And the Bible goes, and, goes on to tell us that he had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. So here's Noah. He's drunk. He's in his tent. And it says that he is naked. And the Bible tells us that his son Ham went into the tent and looked at his father naked. And what Ham did, rather than covering up his daddy, he went back out of the tent and he went and told his brothers. He said, hey, guys, dad got drunk and he's in his tent and I've seen everything. I saw this. I saw that. <laughs> and the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 9 that Noah woke up and he knew that his son had uncovered his nakedness. And the Bible tells us that Noah then looks at Ham and his other two sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and Noah looks at Ham and says, you are cursed, but you're not cursed. Cursed be Canaan. And I read this, I'm thinking to myself like, what? Cursed be, Can cursed be Canaan. The daddy needs to go down because the daddy was in the wrong. Oh, I don't have time to teach this, but just know there was a spirit of perversion that came on Ham. It was an early form of perversion. I'm just going to leave it right there. We got a couple young ones in the room, and I don't want to have conversations that I've already had with them and their parents. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was a spirit of perversion that came upon Ham. And because he had this perverted spirit, he dishonored his father. And the result was a curse. But the curse was not on Ham. The curse was on his son. If you read the lineage and the legacy and the ancestry of Canaan, you can read in Leviticus. I recommend don't read Leviticus by itself. It's a pretty dry book. Like sucking on a chicken bone, you know what I mean? If you could read in the book of Leviticus and you hear about the land of Canaan and how God was bringing the children of Israel into the land, the Canaanites were very perverse. Very perverse. I'll save you from the details. Go ahead and read it. Genesis chapter 18. But here's the result of Ham's dishonor. The dishonor did not result in a curse towards Ham. It resulted in a curse towards his legacy. My friend, you need to understand something this morning, that your dishonor or your honor will result in those who come after you. It's not about you. It's about your children and your children's children. You want to know why I have determined in my heart to be a person of honor? You want to know why? Because I know that what's at stake might not be seen in my life, but it will sure be seen in my children's life. It will sure be seen in my grandchildren's life. The result of your honor or dishonor is always going to be affect, is always going to affect your legacy. Your legacy. So how do we become a person of honor? I'm glad you asked. The way you become a person of honor is not just determining in your heart that you'll be a person of honor, but watch this now. You cover even when people might be worthy of uncovering. You become a person who covers. You become a person who covers. You become a person who covers. 
you realize the Bible is the standard of our life as Christians. And the Bible tells us that love, honor, covers a multitude of sins. The Bible tells us, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. You want to know how you become a person of honor? You cover people. Cover them. Now, I'm not talking about if they break the law or hurt somebody. Hello? Call the police. If you, know, if you need that number, ask your neighbor, because I've never had to call that number before in my life. You know what I mean? 911, in case you're wondering, right? But listen, I'm not talking about if people are hurting somebody or hurting themselves or something like that. But you know what? Don't gossip, y'all. Don't go like Ham did and say, I, oh my gosh, look at this huge mess. Let me go tell somebody. Let me run out of here and just make sure that everybody knows. No. The reason why we don't, we don't do that is because it might not affect our lives, but there's going to be people around us, legacy, who's going to be affected by your dishonor. I cannot tell you how many times I have met people who are in the ministry who are so dissatisfied with their spiritual leadership or sister yay yay or brother so and so. And what they do is they get around the kitchen table and they just start going at it. Did you see them? Did you see their feet? Did you see their hands? Did you see the way they worshiped? Did you, see, did you hear their voice whenever they sang? Or better yet, I've, I'm telling you, well, I've known too many families where they get around a kitchen table and they start bashing the preacher. They start bashing the pastor. And you know what happens? The parents are fine because they hash it out and they're good. But then you look at the children. Wow, are you sure about that? No, I was a youth pastor for many years before we stepped into pastoring. And I can't tell you how many ministry kids were so bitter at God and hated church. Not because I did anything wrong, but because their parents uncovered. Because their parents did not have enough honor in their heart to cover when what needed to be covered. My friend, I'm telling you this morning that you need to determine in your heart that you'll be a person of honor and you need to determine that you will cover when it needs to be covered. Well, what if they dishonor me, Pastor Aaron? You know, what if they just do me wrong? Don't I have a right? No, you don't. You want to know why you don't have a right? Let me tell you a story. Jesus' mother Mary is visited by an angel and the Holy Spirit comes upon her and she becomes pregnant. Amazing. We love children. Yeah, the only problem is that she's still a virgin. She's never known a man. She's engaged to a man, but she's never known a man. Uh-oh. That might be a problem. So Joseph, her betrothed, says that he was a good man and an honorable man. And rather than exposing her, he decided to put her away quietly. Why? Because Joseph understood if he exposed and uncovered that Mary would have been killed. Look, I, I don't know about you, but I think one of the greatest dishonors that someone could ever do is by cheating on somebody and getting pregnant. Can we just talk life? Can we talk real life here? And what did Joseph do? Rather than going and saying, I need to call my lawyer. I need to call uh, TMZ. I need to call up sister so-and-so and brother who-who. We need to have a community engagement. And I need to go tell everybody what this tramp done did on me. No! Joseph did not do that. Why? Because he was a person of honor. Even though it looked like in the natural he had been dishonored, he still chose honor. And guess what? Because even though he felt dishonored and even though he chose honor, guess what the result was? Look it to your left. Look it to your right. 
Are you bought by the blood? Are you in the kingdom? Listen, the result of Joseph's honor was ultimately our salvation. Because if Mary would have died, Jesus would have died, and you would not have salvation through the blood of the spotless lamb. So even when people dishonor you, it's going to happen. Can I just prepare you? I was talking with someone this, this past week, and they said, Pastor, you're always so happy at church, smiling, greeting everybody, and people still seem to be upset with you. And I say, hey, listen, it's par for the course, because people are still going to be people. Now, I'm not saying it's right. It's wrong. But I still choose honor even whenever I have been dishonored. Friend, you need to choose honor even when people dishonor you. Why? Because legacy is at stake. And then lastly, I close with this. Mark chapter 6. Jesus goes, he goes into the city. While he's there, he goes into the temple. And he reads from the Torah. Isaiah chapter 61 The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news, proclaim liberty to the captive, the acceptable year of the Lord to those who are bound up. And it says whenever he gets done, that there's a lot of people around him. I'm paraphrasing because I'm out of time. So you got to read it. And it says whenever he first began to speak, they were all astonished. Oh my goodness. What authority, what anointing. They first were astonished, but then they begin to say to themselves, wait a second, don't we know this guy? Isn't his mother Mary, his brothers and sisters are here with us, and isn't he the carpenter's son? And Jesus goes on to say that a prophet is without honor even in his own hometown. They dishonored Jesus. That story blows me away because they felt something. They sensed something. They were astonished at what was in their presence. The word of God was in their presence. The son of God was in the presence. The Alpha, the Omega was in their presence. The first and the last, the one who is faithful and true. The one whose hair is white like wool and his robe is dipped in blood was in their presence and they begin to have a stirring in their spirit. They begin to sense something. They begin to say, oh my goodness, we have never felt anything like this before in our life. Boy, this Wait, wait a second. Wait. We know him. That's just Jesus. What's so astounding to me, but that portion of scripture, after Jesus said a prophet is without honor in his own home, the Bible goes on to tell us in Mark, Mark chapter 6 that Jesus could do no mighty works there except lay hands on a few people. The result of their dishonor was a stop of the flow of the supernatural. Friends, I've never met anyone who has mocked miracles actually receive a miracle. I've never met anybody who has mocked divine healing who is act- and who's actually needed healing receive healing. I've never met anyone who needed a breakthrough in their life but they make fun of people who speak in tongues. I've never seen them receive a breakthrough. And I'm not saying that it can't happen. But what you honor and what you dishonor will result in what comes back into your life. And the result of this dishonor in this third story, it wasn't necessarily the community, it wasn't necessarily their legacy. 
the result of this dishonor was for them personally. Because you know there was people in the crowd that needed a touch from God. You know there was people in that crowd that needed a miracle in their body. You know that there was blind there. There was sick there. There was the lame there. Why do we know that? Because just look at the life of Jesus. Everywhere he went, he healed people. But because they dishonored him, the flow of the supernatural was stopped and they missed out personally. Mm. In this house, I don't want us to miss out. It's all right. I don't want us to miss out on the supernatural. Well, you're just the miracle guy, right? You just like miracles. Yes, I do. Why? Because people need them. Well, you're just the deliverance church, right? You have people get demons cast out of them, right? Yes, we do. Because people need freedom. You have people come in from all over the city, coming to your church, and they get saved, right? The homeless, the schizophrenic, the down and outers, right? Yes, we do. Because they need salvation. This is all supernatural. Friends, listen, for your life, for your children's life, for this church, we will not miss out on what God is wanting to do. So lastly, how do we become a person of honor? It's by placing a high value on what God places a high value on. We place a high value on what God places a high value on. Stand with me all over the room. Thanks for joining us and listening to this week's podcast. I want to give a special thanks to those who generously give to this ministry. It's because of your generosity that this ministry is made possible If you would like to give, you can click the link in the show notes or go to overflowchurch.co slash give. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe and share this with your friends. And listen, if you're in the Las Vegas area, we would love to see you at one of our weekend services. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.